one thing you should know about me, my, ba my favorite movie, Back to the Future. It's just the greatest film of all time, and I will tell you my nearly two-year-old boy, he'll be two tomorrow, his favorite book is, now he calls it Marty Carr book, but it is Back to the Future. I've always loved the idea of time travel, and Earlier uh, last year, I was reading this, this incredible book by Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist, educator, uh, inspirational. And in this book, while he talks about US politics and technology and astrophysics, he speaks about something in particular that caught my eye and really stuck with me. He proposes that the world becomes unrecognizable every 30 years. Roughly once a generation, once a human generation, we no longer recognize the world we live in. So if we do a little thought experiment, and we took someone from 1994, and we fast forwarded them to the world of today, I think it holds true. In fact, that person would be lost. They would not understand the little black rectangle that each of you have, either within distance or in your pockets right now. They wouldn't know terms like Google, or Facebook, or Meta, or Instagram, or TikTok. They'd be even more blown away than we are by tools like ChatGPT and Claude. But that same pattern would hold true if you took someone from 1964 and you brought them to 1994. So I've always thought about that idea of that generational change and how the world looks so different. Uh, I'm a big book nerd, so I'm going to tell you about another book that I love. Uh, about 15 years ago, and this could not be a better room to tell you about this book. A Canadian science fiction author named Robert Sawyer released three books, well, sequentially. They were called the WWW series, Wake, Watch, and Wonder. The reason I picked it up, aside from being a science fiction nerd, was that they take place in Waterloo, Ontario. Book, the first book, actually, I think, won the Hugo Award. Um, but they take place in Waterloo, Ontario. They take place in the birthplace of Blackberry and the Perimeter Institute and the IQC. And the premise of the book, 2009 it was published, was an AI has awoken on the internet. However, it is a young girl who is visually impaired who discovers it. Because she uses an accessibility device to interact with her computer, she is the first one to notice it. And she befriends this entity. Now I'm going to spoil a bunch of the book for you and I'm sorry about that. In the second book, she convinces her friend, the AI, that it would be helpful for its own good to convince the world that exists for good and not evil. So the AI has an idea. That day, it reads cancer research. It reads every clinical study, every research, every trial that's ever been done in all of human history and ever been published about cancer. That night, it hacks into the Globe and Mail, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, every major newspaper in the world, and changes the cover of the newspaper. The next day, the world wakes up to the same cover of every newspaper in the world, a singular cure for cancer. The premise, the idea, the, the thought experiment of it was, what if we had already solved it? What if we just didn't have the ability to zoom out far enough. Because when a researcher at an amazing university is doing research on cancer, they are working on a sliver that's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the problem. But what if you could zoom out and see the whole problem and see all the work that was done? What if you had a tool that could ingest unimaginable amounts of data and synthesize them into a singular, simple answer? It's the world we live in today. I am not proposing that there is a simple cure to cancer out there, but as a thought experiment, what if there were? And we have the technology to do some of this now, and it's advancing at a rate that I think uh, none of us has ever seen before. So uh, for tonight, what I wanted to do was kind of go through uh, a bit of an exploration on AI. Um, and think about the disruption it has, but will continue to cause. But I want to do it through a framework called now, next, never. So uh, 
we're going to play along a couple of times. If you were here in the afternoon, it's not going to be breakout group discussions. I won't be walking around telling you what to do. But if you have your rectangle, your smartphone near you, and you would like to play along, you can scan this uh, QR code. It'll be a couple of minutes before you need it. If you don't get it now, if your mouth's full, I mean, you should still be able to do it. But if you can't get it right now, that's OK. The URL will be up when I need you to interact with me. You can also put questions in as you go, um, or as I go, if you will. Uh, so I'll give you just a moment to scan it. Like I said, if you've missed it now, that's OK. So I better introduce myself. I'm Remy. Uh, earlier today, I put up a slide that looks a lot like this, and I just had a picture of me. And as I thought about it, I'm standing right near. You don't need more of me. So that should is my son, who will be two years old tomorrow. That picture was taken uh, last week. That's Riley, and I just thought it'd be a more fun picture and a better way to introduce myself. Uh, I run a company called Thousand Days Out. I do uh, keynote speaking engagements. I do workshops, and I do a little bit of consulting work on the side uh, with a small team of strategists and designers. I'm a weird person who loves what he does and finds it strange that people pay me to do stuff that I love. I get to spend a lot of my time thinking about the future and thinking about technology. Uh, as mentioned, I've got actually two boys, a 12-year-old and a 2-year-old. The 2-year-old's cuter right now uh, and a wonderful uh, partner at home. Uh, in a past life, I ran innovation for a company called Mattel. <laughs> that's, that's the right pronunciation, right? Did you notice by halfway in, I was actually, the AI was telling me what to do as opposed to the other way. Yeah, that, that'll happen. Uh, yeah, I ran innovation for Mattel for a couple of years. My whole world was Barbies and Hot Wheels. Uh, it was a really good time. The lab was actually based out of Community Tech, which was great, even though it was an LA-based company. Uh, I teach at a couple of different universities in Canada, one in the US and one in Norway of all places, and uh, have a book coming out later this year. That's probably enough about me. Let's talk about what we're going to do tonight. AI now, when I talk about this idea of now, it's actually a little bit of a reflection back. How did we get here? And I'm going to tell you a story about three board games, because I'm a big nerd, and that's another thing I like. I like board games. I want to look a little bit ahead to the next five years, not what the next release of ChatGPT or the next version of Bard's going to do, but on a bit of a longer time horizon. And then I want us to think critically about responsible and ethical use of AI. And Warning, I'm going to share one example with you that will uh, hopefully scare you um, and hopefully drive a different perspective on the topic. So this is your chance. I'm going to give you 90 seconds if you have the QR code open. If not, you can type menti.com, and hopefully the numbers are big enough to see, and you can put in that eight-character code. Give me a five-word sentence, a seven-word sentence, something simple. I would love to know how this room of CEOs and leaders across our community thinks about this question. What are the opportunities for AI to create good, positive impact today? And in a moment or two, and this is not going to be surprising to about half the room, we're going to use some AI and a little bit of magic to group your 100 or so responses into some of the common themes. So as I look at what I see here, uh, improve customer experience, jobs, make everything more efficient, personalized experiences. Improve health equity. I love that. That is wonderful to see. I see improved patient outcomes. I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds to enter a couple more things here. We've already got 50 responses, and that should be enough to sort of see what the common themes are. Uh, I will share with those who weren't here this afternoon a really interesting discussion we had about that idea of productivity and efficiency, where we said, you know, this holy grail of AI is to make us more productive. It will free us up from the tasks that used to take up our time, but the real paradox is, We've heard that story before. It was the smartphone. And yet, it made us somehow more busy. And so that'll be an interesting challenge to work through. Let's see if the magic works here. I'm going to press this button. There we go. And it's doing a little bit of NLP, a little bit of uh, large language model magic here. There's enough responses. This might take a second. Cool. Inspiring, honestly. On the theme of AI for good, tech for good, uh, nothing could make me happier than seeing healthcare as the first thing that you all as leaders said the biggest disruptive opportunity was for AI. That's awesome. Productivity, problem solving, efficiency. I'm going to share all this with you afterwards so we won't go into every little detail here and you don't need to take pictures. You're welcome to, but you don't need to. Community connection, what an interesting one. I want to know what people said under that. So the four comments that this tool grouped up under that, AI girlfriends and boyfriends. <laughs> And whoever said it's excited, because it's in all caps, by the way. 
help connect people around the world, give us hope for the future, synthesize data information to help people connect, build community, improve well-being and belonging. Uh, I certainly hope so. This is wonderful to see. Three of the four, let's say. This is wonderful to see. Okay, my turn. So I told you I love the idea of time. I love the idea of time travel. Back to the Future is my favorite movie. So I want to go back in time to 1997 and share with you four important things, but one really important that happened. So George Clooney was Time Magazine's Person of the Year. They actually said Man of the Year back then, but uh, they've since called it Person of the Year. J.K. Rowling wrote and published the first Harry Potter book. Not movie, book. She now has... Uh, she's now wealthier than the royal family, so that worked out well for her. Titanic sailed into theaters and into our hearts. But probably the most interesting thing that happened to a game nerd like me was a game of chess. Some of you are probably recognizing which game of chess it was. By the way, not a real book. Thank you, AI, for making me my A Tale of Three board games uh, cover here. I want to talk to you about this particular game of chess. Does anyone recognize this person? Kasparov. Kasparov, thank you. Gary Kasparov. At the time, the highest ranked chess player in the world. And in 1997, he played a very strange game of chess. Because he did not play against the gentleman he's sitting across from. That person, whose name I do not know, that person's job was to read what the computer told him to do and to move the chess piece. Does anyone here play chess? Okay. If we were to play chess, I'm not very good. I play with my 12-year-old once in a while. In my head, it goes something like this. I'll do this, he'll do that. I do this, he might do that. I do this, he'll do that. What was my first move in that sequence again? I can get roughly three moves back and forth in my head, and I can't really remember what the first move of that sequence was. Well, when Gary Kasparov played chess against Deep Blue, Deep Blue was able to do about 20 billion calculations per second. If you take that into the amount of time allotted for a move in, the, in that match of chess, it was the equivalent of calculating about 12 moves and counter moves into the future. Here's the thing though. It calculated not one combination of 12 moves and counter moves. It calculated all of them. Deep Blue wasn't AI. Deep Blue was a time machine. It could see 24 moves into the future, every possible state of the board. And all it had to do was pick the first one, the one with the highest positional advantage and make that move. Now, I'm obviously oversimplifying a little bit, but it was essentially brute force. But that was the state of the art in terms of computation in gameplay at the time. Now, if we fast forward, we get back in our uh, imaginary time machine, and we're going to go forward almost to the month, 20 years into the future, we get to a literal and figurative mirror image. Does anyone know who this is? This is a tougher one. I hear Go, that's not who it is, but Go is the game that he's playing, and this is a gentleman, a Korean Go player, highest ranked player of the game of Go at the time, named Lee Sedol. In 2017, he was the first, it was the first time a computer, in this case AlphaGo, had beaten the world's best rated Go player. So it was a much, much harder problem to solve. It took us 20 years from beating a chess player to beating a Go player. Why was it harder? In the game of Go, there is 10 to the 170. If you've forgotten your scientific notation, it's a one with 170 zeros behind it. Possible states the board can be in. It is an unfathomably big number. There are 10 to the 80 atoms in the entire known universe. It would take till the end of time to do a brute force attempt at the game of Go. Enter deep learning. We, the, the collective we, use deep learning, which is very, very loosely, at least inspired by how our biology and how our brains work, to learn the strategies of Go and to train an algorithm based on past games. The game was so interesting. There's a documentary, it's free on YouTube because it's quasi-advertising for Google. You wouldn't think it's as exciting as it is. It is an incredibly exciting documentary to watch. There's a moment in the third match where the commentator, and yes, professional Go commentator's a job someone has, actually says, rookie mistake by AlphaGo, Lee's going to win this one. About a dozen moves later, Lee resigned. Neither Lee, nor the commentator, nor anyone else had ever even seen that strategy before. 
it did something completely novel and unexpected. If you pick up a modern textbook on the game of Go, and unless you play, please don't, you will find that strategy now documented and named after some of the founders of, of the company that Google had acquired. Deep learning unlocked for us the potential of AI. Suddenly we weren't using just raw computing power, we were building new strategies and we were approaching something that looked like intelligence. This matters more than you think though. Uh, Tom earlier said the elephants are, did you say tiptoeing, dancing, yeah. tickling? Dancing. It's not just <laughs> tickling, it's not just Google and Meta where those elephants are. During this game ago, 280 million people watched in China. 120 million people watched the Super Bowl this year, and yet more than twice that many people in China watched this game of Go. They're deeply interested in AI and the potential of it. This is five years ago. This matters on a global stage. This number, this is nearly a quarter of a billion people who, by the way, it was the middle of the night for them, watched this game. Let's go forward five more years, roughly. 2022, has anyone played the game Diplomacy before? We've now gone from tools like AlphaGo that are based on pure logic and reasoning to something totally new. Because if you read a little bit about how the game is played, it's not just logic and reasoning. You have to collaborate to win. You have to work with others. Cicero, the uh, algorithm developed by Meta, Facebook's parent company, uh, after one tournament was ranked as the, one of the top 10% players globally, its average score was more than double, uh, sorry, its ranking and score is more than double of the average player. But the crazy thing is it could both form alliances with human players and build trust, and yet you could lie and deceive in this game. So it understood when to lie, when to be honest, when to collaborate, and when to compete in order to win. It intersects large language models and natural language processing with deductive reasoning models like used by AlphaGo. This is the state of AI today. In fact, if we think about where we are now, it's the age of generative AI. And when I asked uh, uh, an image generation tool to make me a picture of Gary Kasparov playing chess against a robot, I got this, and this is probably about a year old, so I could probably get a better one today. If you look up a picture of him, this is remarkably accurate. I didn't explain who Gary Kasparov was. I didn't do anything. Now, I will point out, I have triple checked the fact Gary Kasparov does not have six fingers on his right hand. <laughs> the tools are imperfect, but still scary. This is AI now. So four things that I've seen over the last little while and shifts that I think are happening today to share with you. First one, we are massively democratizing and making accessible not only large language models, but all different types of AI. ChatGPT and other tools are either free, you may be paying in other ways than cash, or very, very low cost, and they're incredibly powerful. All of a sudden, this is becoming accessible to the masses. We have the rapid emergence of what is called multimodal AI, that means an AI that could go back and forth between things like images, video, audio, text, and other modalities of communication. This is vitally important. I do a lot of work in the clinical trials industry, and one of the hardest problems we've been trying to solve has been ingesting a protocol for a clinical trial and, un and kind of building a common data model around it. This is the answer to that, because these are incredibly complex tables where we can't be 99% right. It needs to be certain. Multimodal AI is the answer for that. Edge AI. Edge AI is the ability for the devices at the, it's called the edge of the network. If you come from technology background, you're familiar with edge computing. The devices in your hands and in your homes to actually run the algorithms and do the processing. That has a tremendous potential for positive environmental impact, but a much more interesting one. All of a sudden, a lot of our concerns about data privacy and security are maybe not made to go away, but certainly alleviated when the data that you need to put into an algorithm never leaves your phone and it doesn't go up into the cloud to be processed. And then the last one, and the probably most interesting, on February 24th, 
of this year, what, two weeks ago, something interesting happened. Organizations are now being held accountable for the outputs of their AI. Air Canada was held accountable for the incorrect output that its AI last year gave a traveler for the wrong price for a ticket, and they had to pay back that traveler $888. Not a big financial hurdle, but the precedent that sets. They actually tried to argue that the AI was a separate legal entity from Air Canada, and they were not accountable for it. It was struck down in a court in BC, a tribunal in BC, and I think this is just the beginning of that. So the notion of accountability is a really, really important one to think about today. One more piece of this, I'm gonna share some words from Andrew Ning, who's just an incredible AI thought leader. As electricity transformed everything a century ago, it's hard to imagine any part of our modern world not changing as a result of AI. And I'm gonna share an example that he gives in one of his uh, lectures at Stanford the single biggest application of AI. Any guesses? Homework? Did you say homework? Yeah. No. <laughs> Optical, character Optical character recognition. That'd probably be a good one. It's, you're not going to like the answer. It's advertising. <laughs> I did some napkin math, and I took the most conservative numbers I could find, and even with those, in North America alone, Somewhere around a half a trillion ads are shown a year, digitally. Every one of those ads is tuned by AI. Every time you see a website and there's an ad on there, somewhere in the background, an, ad, an algorithm looked at who you are, your history, your bio, what it knows about you, and tried to find the ad you are most likely to click on, combined with a couple other things that will make them the most money. It's for that reason that Google can have thousands of engineers at the elephants, if you will, can have thousands, if not tens of thousands of engineers working on this problem. The next biggest one is web search. But we're entering kind of the long tail phase of this. And I saw an incredible example of a packaged food company that makes frozen pizzas. And they are now using AI off of a little Logitech webcam on their manufacturing line to measure if the cheese is evenly distributed on the pizza to improve the quality of their products. Just a few years ago, that would have been a nonsense thing to do because the cost in R&D to develop that would have been so exorbitant to just be a nonsense use case. But suddenly low code and no code tools where you're literally plugging and playing elements, uh, plugging pieces of code together that already exist or blocks are enabling us to go down this long tail path of AI. And that goes down that same story of accessibility and democratization. So that small businesses that would never have thought of hiring an engineer to build custom code might still use this technology to transform their business. Every business in the world would be impacted by this. So let's switch from the now to the next. What might we expect, and I don't believe in forecasting, but I do believe in foresight, what might we think the next five years would entail for us? First one, and we've already started down this, but we're going to see a foundational, a really existential shift in the nature of work, and we are going to see impacts to humans. It was mentioned this afternoon uh, when in, in a town hall at some other company, uh, a quote that happened was someone asked, will AI take my job? And the answer back was, AI won't take your job, but another employee who knows how to work with AI will. But some jobs will be displaced by AI. There's zero doubt about that. In fact, if they weren't, then why would anyone be spending the money on this stuff? You can see all kinds of wonderful McKinsey and Deloitte and other consulting forecasts. AI is a $10 trillion, a $13 trillion industry over the next decade, all these crazy numbers. If we want $10 trillion of value unlocked from this, we're either making $10 trillion more or we're saving $10 trillion somewhere else. It will have an impact on all of our work. We're going to see, I, sadly, I think we're gonna see more and more threats from bad actors, bad states, um, who are wielding power like they've never had before. As far as I know, the city of Hamilton has, due to a cyber attack, lost almost all of its city um, 
online services. I was in Chicago for a presentation a few weeks ago, and it just ironically, as I was driving through Chicago, I heard on the radio that the largest children's hospital in Chicago had been essentially taken offline by a cyber attack. It's a daily occurrence now. But the flip side of that is there is incredible research working towards bringing empathy, the foundations of design thinking, the foundations of real human-centric problem solving into AI. And there's some really, really cool stuff happening on that front. And finally, we're gonna start seeing intersections of these major technology fronts. The intersection of AI, quantum computing, and synthetic biology is going to radically shift the landscape over the next five to 10 years. In fact, uh, the term has been coined, uh, it's not mine, it's called the coming wave. Uh, the founder of DeepMind, uh, Mustafa Suleiman, kind of coined that term. He wrote a book by the title as well. It's a fascinating book about uh, AI and synthetic biology in particular. I added in quantum computing because I think that's a part of it. And he talks about what happens when these intersect. He speaks about the ability to, do, uh, to accelerate everything from drug development to how we approach climate change at levels that we just can't imagine right now because of the automation, because of our ability to overcome our intellectual limitations as humans. That's where we're going. It also will do the exact opposite. So when we think about threats and we think about bad actors, we think about the opposite of AI for good and tech for good, everything from cybersecurity threats to a theoretical technology singularity that takes us all over are all part of that story as well. Wonderful book if you are interested in it. So the foundation of that kind of challenge to me is, it comes from the words of Edward O. Wilson of biology, who in 2009, this is a 15-year-old quote, said, we have paleolithic brains, medieval institutions, and godlike technologies. And our technologies are continuing to outpace our institutions, and they're certainly outpacing our biology. So that takes us to the, I don't want it to be negative, but the kind of negative side of this, AI never. What are the things we want to make sure we never do? What are the lines we never want to cross? I want to share with you two examples, one that will be close to home for at least one of you. These are two photographs. Does anyone recognize the device in these? They were super unpopular until COVID came around. Infrared thermometers. So a little while back, someone ran these two through Google's labeling algorithm. They took the picture on the right, and Google thought, yep, this is a piece of technology, some sort of electronic device, a camera, maybe a phone, and obviously the one on the left is a gun. It's obvious, isn't it? Now, you can play devil's advocate. A handful of you are thinking right now, Remy, one of them is white, one of them is dark green. Obviously, that one looks a little bit more like a gun. So the, the people doing this research went one further. They used what I can only assume is Microsoft Paint, because it's so poorly done, and they recolored the hand holding the green thermometer. Probably not a surprise. Google was no longer threatened. All of a sudden, it was holding a monocular, a pretty obscure device, if you ask me. But clearly, the white person would not be holding a gun. This is what happens when systemic bias creeps its way into the algorithms we use. The risk of bias is not, bias isn't a bad thing. We are all biased, we're all human beings, we're all the product of nature and nurture. But bias that is in our data can be reflected back, and in this case, even be amplified back to terrifying consequences. So I'm gonna share another example with you, and this is closer to home. Uh, I did something kind of mean. Uh, I picked a company at random. I will not, no matter what you offer me, I will not say who the company was, but it's a company that's in this room. And what I did was I asked an AI to look at that company. I asked it to look for, um, le I'm gonna skip ahead here. I'm gonna ask it to look for specific weaknesses in the company's terms and conditions and privacy policies. I looked for specific case precedents that could be used if I wanted to sue that company. I asked for financial analysis, uh, looking for uh, 
unfair anti-competitive behaviors or practices that might be happening based on reporting. And I asked it to look for potential IP infringements from other existing IP and patents out there. It gave me a roadmap. It gave me something that was just terrifying to see. This is the technology of today. This isn't even some futuristic thing. I did this a week ago, and it really, really shook me to see how much I could dig up, and it gave me exact strategies on how I would, if you were a competitor of mine, how I would hire a couple of lawyers and take you down through frivolous lawsuits and things like that. I'm not a bad person. I'm not going to do it, just so we're clear. But this is the world that we live in today. So the question back to you, I'm going to ask you to participate one more time here before we wrap things up. You are all CEOs and leaders of companies. What responsibility do you have to ensure that we use AI for good? So I'm going to give you a moment here to answer that question. If you close the tab or whatever, you can type in menti.com. Fairness, people, community, ensure no adverse impact. Leadership, audit, train, oh, train is so important. Education is the answer to this within your employee communities, within your boards of directors, within your investors, all of those communities. This is going to get too small to read in just a moment here. Fairness, people, uh, protection, and this is wonderful to see, and I hope that everyone walks away thinking about these things. There's one more piece I kind of want to leave you with tonight, though. This is Hokusai's painting, The Great Wave. It's, it's my favorite painting. It is one of the most recognizable paintings, probably aside from the Mona Lisa, in the world. Hokusai in Japan painted this thing. He inspired the likes of Monet, Van Gogh, Riviere. In fact, if you look at Starry Night closely, you look at the stars and the swirls of the stars, you can see the wave pattern here and the way it swirls. It inspired a lot, but that's not why I like it. In the 1830s, when he painted the series, in fact, it's actually not called The Great Wave. Uh, it's actually one of 36 uh, paintings about uh, Mount Fuji. But when he painted this in the 1830s, he brought in technologies that had never been used before in Japan, new types of pigments to, to create the rich colors that he did, and a block printing process that gave it its unique appearance, but also allowed for the mass production of paintings that had never been done before. This is technology. We like to think of technology as, as computers and smartphones and AI, but 200 years ago, this is what technology was. Technology is the concretization of our human imagination. Technology is literally our ability to be creative and bring that to life. It is the most human thing I can think of in a way, even though we think of technology as not really human. And so we don't have to just go back 200 years. We can go back 100,000 years. We can go back to a savanna in Africa where early hominids are walking around using sticks to hit trees to knock fruit down. Back then, we were using technology in the form of a stick to overcome our physical limitations. And we've done that ever since. But I think we're at a new frontier. We are no longer overcoming our physical limitations. We are overcoming our intellectual limitations. That's where we are going today. When we started today, I asked you, or I shared with you an example about a thought experiment about the end of cancer, a singular cure of cancer. And my hope is that as you leave tonight, you no longer think of that as necessarily a science fiction concept, but actually something that could happen, maybe even in our lifetimes. Technology is accelerating at a nonlinear pace. And so whereas earlier I told you that the world is unrecognizable every 30 years, I have a feeling it's going to be 15 years, and then maybe 10, and then maybe 5. So it's on us to think about what that means. And so I'm going to leave you with the words of my favorite AI thought leader, Fei Fei Li, AI does not have a conscience, but we do, and it's our job to ensure that it's developed and deployed ethically to avoid reinforcing human biases. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure, and I think we probably have a moment or two for some questions.